All right. Here we are. We are live. Thanks, Katie, so much for being here with me tonight. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. We're all moved in to our new home in Cary, North Carolina, and I'm actually sitting on a couch that was delivered today. So ooh, we're feeling good about everything. <laughs> That's right. You just moved. And so thank you for taking some time out of your training and moving and your parents just left and your in-laws just left. So thank you so much for taking time out. Oh, my you pleasure. could be having your feet up rested right now, but you're talking to me. So thank you very much. No problem. <laughs> well, um, I wanted to have you on because I feel like we can get a lot of perspective from you as an elite professional triathlete. And I, as an amateur athlete, I love sport. You love sport. I think we can both share our passion for triathlon. And sport, I feel like, just offers us so much goodness in life. But unfortunately, there's also a dark side. I often say that there are side effects of sport and beyond injuries. And it's not uncommon for athletes to struggle with eating disorders, disordered eating, body image dissatisfaction, and other mental health issues. And a lot of athletes are taught from a very young age that lighter equals faster. And the consequences of not fueling properly, they can be quite devastating in terms of mental and physical health. And I find that, and we were just talking about this, that sometimes with athletes, there's we, we discuss athletes who have those issues and they're brought to our attention and then we we have conversations about it or perhaps an athlete has a comeback and we have conversations but there's kind of this blank period of time where there's no discussion about these very important topics and so i i commend the athletes that are kind of pushing down the stigma, talking about issues with mental health and disordered eating and eating disorders. But I really want to continue to raise awareness on these topics and helping athletes build more uh, better body image and create good habits for fueling the body for sport and just for overall health. So that is why I wanted to have you on today to get your perspective. Yes, happy to share. I definitely have experienced a lot on the pathway to be to where I am now and uh, have learned a lot. Yeah. And I think that's really important to to recognize that, you know, as athletes, we have journeys and we have different chapters in the journey. And we hopefully we can learn a lot from each of those chapters. So my first question for you is, do you feel that athletes have an unrealistic standard or high expectations and pressure to achieve a specific body image for sport? I, th I think that depends a lot on what your environment is that surrounds you. Um, I, I felt in the running community, I felt that more so than when I became a triathlete. Almost when I became a triathlete after college, I was like, Oh, these are my people because it felt like a different body type. It felt like a strong body type, more muscular, a little and not so like tiny, I guess, was how I perceived a lot more runners. Um, and I also think there's pressure on ourselves to do it, comparing ourselves to others, which is so easy with social media. And so those kind of combined, I think, make the unrealistic standards that we would hold, try to hold ourselves accountable to. But like I said, I feel most of my career I've had, and I say career being like spanning from high school till, till now, not just my professional career, has been with people who never had me like counting calories or never made me. I had like one conversation, I think, in college when they were like, trying to do have like a more like um watch my diet type conversation i didn't really catch on to it at the time <laughs> until like later which is probably good but um for me i've been very happy that i have the mentors that have shown me how to eat in a healthy way and not in a super restrictive way 
Okay. And that would kind of leads into my next question where, with where does that pressure come from? So like you said, some of it could be coaches, it could be um, other athletes. Do you find that it's, it's really helped you to be or find the right people? And how did you know that these were the right people? Yeah, for sure. I've gotten really lucky with finding the right people. And I think also like just I, I really enjoy food. So for me to have like <laughs> a restrictive diet would be just, I would be grumpy and I would be unpleasant <laughs> and <laughs> just probably not happy. But like when I was in, when I was in college, there was a grad assistant who, um, this was after like the conversation that I didn't really catch on was about my body weight. But I w reached out to her and I was like, okay, like her name's Maureen. I was like, okay, Maureen, like how, like how she was a professional runner as well. So back, qualified background, <laughs> um, yeah. but like, I was like, how do I eat better? Because I didn't know about serving sizes. I, which I didn't realize like how I wanted to eat. I just didn't have the knowledge base to make educated decisions. But I know like eating like Dunkin', Don Dunkin Donuts every day from the dining hall was probably not the, <laughs> the best thing, but she took me to a grocery store and she showed me how to make my way around the grocery store and how to what type of foods I might be m more interested to stockpile my like pantry with. And then um, she, we went to her house and she, we cooked together. And those were things that I really valued because it was showing me how to do it. And, and it was in a way that wasn't like a particular diet or having certain foods over other certain, it was just the wholeness of the nutrition. And then after that, um, after graduating, I got introduced to my current nutritionist, Sean Spanbauer. And I really just love his way of looking at nutrition because it, again, it's not restrictive, but it's also like sometimes it's, it's reflective, I guess would be how I would describe it. Where if I'm in a certain phase of my training where I'm going from off season to starting the season, wanting to lose off all that weight that I'd put on during my off season, then he's like, okay, well, like, did you have to have that second serving? Like, were you hungry for it? Or was it just kind of habit to eat? Because that's what I'll get into. I'll just get into like, habitual eating. So him asking me these questions isn't saying, don't eat it. But it's saying why, and then I'm like, oh, like maybe you're right. Like I didn't need that like second serving. Or like the other day, he's like, all right, have a dessert today. Like where I know other athletes who've had like nutritionists or coaches, way more like they feel uh, almost guarded where they're like, well, I don't want to tell someone I ate this or. Um, they're guilted into what they're having. And I don't feel like I've ever had uh, anybody who has been guiding me in nutrition do that to me. And I think that's really something special. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. So it, it sounded like the first person that you worked with gave you tools um, instead of a plan and kind of gave you the tools, but you were in charge of building the house. And then now where you are today, you have someone there helping you, but it's not so much in telling you what to do, but really allowing you to be in control by figuring out the your decisions on your own by reflecting on why and when you're eating and hopefully giving you tools as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when I first started working with him, it was in 2013. And so this is what, eight years later, and we've adapted nutrition over the years, I've picked up on it. So like every year we have, um, we have this thing, I just need someone to hold me accountable a lot of the time. So we have this routine where when I'm going from kind of like off season, not really thinking about nutrition, not thinking about my diet, just eating what really what I want to go in and to be like, okay, I'm going to be more thoughtful about my choices. And I'll just send him a picture on uh, Facebook Messenger of every single thing I eat. Like that's, that's what's easy for me. It's not is showing him and then he'll just give me like a thumbs up or like a, a gif or like <laughs> sometimes he'll he'll give me more feedback and like oh like have more of this or less of that but because that's been how we've been working together like now I don't talk to him daily I don't send him pictures daily because I'm in 
I'm in my routine and I'm mm -hmm. making good choices. And if I feel like I'm like not making good choices, then I'll be like, all right, Sean, <laughs> like I need you back. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds like you guys have a good relationship, which is really important. Yes. <laughs> so what advice would you have for athletes as it relates to kind of conforming to this idealized body image? I mean, you spoke about yourself kind of going through phases with your nutrition. So what advice do you have for other athletes when they just feel this deep pressure, like they have to look a certain way? One is get off the comparison train and whether that involves you limiting your social media or looking at it in a different way, I limit my social media because for me, if I don't, if I'm looking at Instagram or whatever feed and I'm not getting like a positive feeling from it, then mm -hmm. I'm just like, oh, I'll just like mute, ignore, unfollow, like any of those because I don't need that. I don't, that's yeah. not healthy for me. And I would say another part of it is understanding how much your body has done for you right now. Um, like there's been times I think having a little bit of self-consciousness or maybe like a lack of confidence in our body types while I wish I could say I always feel super confident in how I look and feel like it's not the case, but I can recognize like, well, I won a world championship with this body. Like mm -hmm. I, I did this with this body and looking at the things that I've achieved with my body type. And it's not a super like, I mean, like I like, I'm, I'm very <laughs> like confident in my body type overall, like in, in the general sense, but there are certain days where I'll like wake up and I'm like, eh, like, <laughs> yeah. but being able to like move through that and realize like, wow, like look at how much incredible things I've like this body has done. Like, mm -hmm. and also I think finding the right balance for you is a huge part of it and being able to be reflective because like, uh, of course you can go, like we're talking definitely about going like the opposite direction and being too thin and like under not having enough energy, but it could also be like the opposite where you're doing, you're eating too much. And I think it's important to not base what your feeling is on how you look in either, like, well, obviously there's. Yeah, the spectrum. There's spectrums on this. But like, no, like what makes you feel good? What gives you energy? When are you like not feeling sluggish? And if you start feeling like you don't have energy, you probably don't have energy. <laughs> you should probably eat a little bit more or eat something different <laughs> yeah. um, to give you that energy. And really being able to, I, I would even recommend not, I don't wanna say counting calories because I, I don't really like that, but, mm -hmm having a general sense in your journal or whatever it is to say like I feel good today I had energy today and be able to keep track of like oh whoops we went the, we went the wrong way in this direction and like bounce back yeah yeah I think that's really important you bring up such a good point that you know body confidence doesn't mean that you always feel good about yourself it's very normal to have days. Um, I don't like when athletes say that I'm feeling fat. Um, I think a better way to say it is I'm feeling uncomfortable in my body today. Yeah. Um, and just kind of acknowledging that today I just feel different or I'm just not, you know, very comfortable with how I feel. But then it's working through those thoughts. And like you said, maybe going back to some highlights, some positives. Um, it's very ironic how sometimes you can have a great workout and then right afterwards you can feel very upset about your body when you're showering or whatever. Yeah. So it's being able to be careful where, where those thoughts go and that they don't lead to unhealthy action. So I think that's really great that even as a, a professional athlete, that you still acknowledge that there's days that you feel uncomfortable with your body, but it's how you deal with it. Yeah. Now, I would like to know, because speaking of this, I feel that, you know, a lot of athletes blame their body or nutrition as those 
those are the things that limit me the most. And there's just so many different things that make up being a great athlete. So I'd love to hear from you. You know, was it hard for you to find some of your genetic strengths, these things that make you great? I think a lot of times we have such a hard time talking about our good things. We, we kind of pick on our, you know, these are the areas that I need to improve on. But we need to acknowledge what we're good at because sometimes that can lead us to the right coaches, the right training, the right races for us. Um, so for you as a female athlete, were there what are some of the unique qualities that you have that you have found in your body that make you a great athlete? Well, I think like generally speaking, I just consider myself a strong athlete. I've always felt like that's one of my characteristics. That's something I use as my mantra, like when I'm, and that's something that always is what brings me back to the confidence part is if, if I don't have a super tiny body, like, well, I'm, a, I have a strong body. I have a, like, I have endurance and I even like to think this isn't necessarily genetic, but it starts with genetic is that everything I've done in the past has led me to the body that I have now. So like playing soccer when I was younger, mm -hmm. playing lacrosse, swimming, like all of that, I'm like, wow, this has made me, this has given me this strong body. And um, I think that has been a huge part of how I perceive myself, I guess, and things I feel like down to my core is like a great thing. And mm -hmm. um, uh, not, I'm knocking on wood here, but like I, the injuries I've had have all been self-inflicted through crashing yeah. and not <laughs> like- We're like accidents. Yes, <laughs> like not anything, through body composition, mm -hmm. and I, I guess I've, I think also with like maybe with genetics as well is that like my man, well maybe not genetics that might be the wrong word, but like my family, my parents have like always supported me like no matter what phase I was in of my life and what I looked like, and I never felt like that was a topic really and yeah. like I've I've learned some things over the years I wouldn't eat the same way that I normally ate when I was younger but like it's it's all been as we said before it's all been like a learning thing to help me get to where I am but I I guess the like strength endurance part would be you yeah. know the main things that I got through just my parents and then <laughs> and then building off of that <laughs> yeah well i think that's great and and i love that you said the strength and the endurance and also i love how where you were before has brought you to where you are today and then also acknowledging that your body is so strong that you haven't had a lot of setbacks either and so sometimes we need to take our focus away from the look and really think about all the good that our body allows us to do which i think sometimes as athletes it's easy to take for granted the stress that we put on our body day after day hour after hour and all that we expect it to do and and it still shows up and so rather than kind of um, being hard on our bodies, we should be thanking our bodies a little bit more. And I think I, we might be talking about this later. I, I forget, but like just having a long-term view of mm -hmm. everything and not like not looking at the quick fix or like I need mm -hmm. to be this weight at this certain time or, um, but just feeling like, oh, like make changes to your nutrition to have a healthier body whatever that means, but not being trying to be too restrictive or get down to a certain weight, but realize that building over years is fi fine. Like I have a lot, uh, another thing I feel like is a strength is looking long-term. So I've never really tried mm -hmm. to rush into something. And I think that's what's added to being really consistent is that mm -hmm. I just feel like, okay, tick, tick, tick. Like it's the same with my nutrition and my outlook on that as it is with the skills and the endurance and the training perspective. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And what advice would you have if you were talking to another athlete and this athlete just feels like 
I'm not comfortable with my body image. I don't feel like I look like other athletes. What advice would you have for, for that athlete who's trying to build body confidence? Well, I think the first thing I would say is not to like get it. And this is, this is from my sports psych, not my, <laughs> but like, don't, don't resist those thoughts in the sense that you're just battling them in your brain, mm. but recognize like, oh, I feel this way, but, and there, and make sure you have that because that's the most important part, but this is what my body is capable. And mm. these are like changes I can, I can make if, if you want to, but like, first thing is don't just batter yourself down with the negative thoughts, like lead it to something positive. And our bodies are capable of so many amazing things. Mm -hmm. And whether that's like running for an, a minute and walking 30 seconds and doing that for 15 minutes, or whether that's running like 50 to a hundred miles, I don't know. Like there's like a big, <laughs> big spectrum on that, but just knowing you are doing amazing things mm. at this moment. And those amazing things might be different in like a month or a couple years, but right now you're doing good and keep, keep stepping up off that and re just recognize how many, how good you are at this moment. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. Now, now let's get into some heavier topics here talking about this idea of, what uh, I, I know in the triathlon world we call kind of race weight um, in that the idea that lighter equals faster. Um, it's not uncommon for coaches to tell athletes that losing weight will optimize performance or for an athlete to feel like, you know, if only I was a little bit lighter. And I'm not talking about athletes who, um, I mean, there are healthy ways to change your body composition for performance and for health. But unfortunately, a lot of athletes take very extreme and very rigid approaches, um, often for that short term fix of feeling that pressure to, to lose weight, to get lighter. And, and, and there's also, also the misbelief that lighter always equals faster. Um, so I would like you to give your thoughts on do you and your the industry of professional triathlon and short course, do you feel that, and, and running as well, do you feel like there's a relationship between the extreme measures that athletes take to lose weight and then the increase of health issues, performance declines, and burnout, almost like an inverse relationship? The lighter somebody gets, the more issues that they have. Uh, I for sure think that is something that happens in our sport. And um, it's, it's really sad to see because there's, and especially in triathlon, I mean, it, it's, it's bad anywhere, but in triathlon where I feel like you, like in our sport in in ITU, in ITU, like the strong athletes, the bigger athletes, I guess, if you wanted to say that, I don't really like using that as the way to describe it. I always use stronger. It's hard, it's hard to quantify it. It really is to, yeah. to not use these terms. But yes, I understand but what you're saying. Are the like are there throughout the entire race, swim, bike, run? And I think identifying that there's athletes who you wouldn't perceive as being faster because they're not tiny. We're not tiny athletes. We're we're the but we're able to swim, bike and run. And it's such a long race, whether long is considered one hour or 10 hours, like you're going to need the energies to sustain you through that amount of time. And I feel like something that happens with the restrictive dieting and like really limiting your food intake is you're not energizing yourself. It's affecting your training. It's affecting your mood. It's like, it's so, at least for me, the, I, this is all speaking from like, obviously my personal experience, mm -hmm. but like it's mentally depleting energy, which is one of the reasons like when, when I was working with my nutritionist with Sean, we decided to do the pictures is because for me, I can handle the pictures for 
Like it doesn't feel like it's taking energy from me. I don't feel like it's draining and like counting calories or weighing yourself every single day. Like I had to come to a way better, like I do weigh myself every single day, but now I weigh myself every single day in this is so many using the word way, way too much. <laughs> but I like, I like keeping track because I just like to see it. Like it's almost like heart rate to me, but I don't do it now in the way where, oh, if I'm, we use kilos, but if I'm one or two kilos heavier for a day, I'm not like, oh my gosh, like I need to stop eating. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's more a long-term method to keep track, but I can recognize now even when like I'm about to get my period because I put on weight when I'm about to get my period. But I wouldn't have known that when I was younger that that was the case. And like mm -hmm. I might have been reactive to that. And so mm -hmm. it, I think you need people need to see what works for them. And if like weighing themselves is a, a negative thing and something that brings up like like emotions that are just going to cause anxiety or stress or be like a numbers game, then I don't think weighing every day mm -hmm. is for that person. But because I, they can become a very like dangerous game of, mm -hmm. Oh, can I beat that number? And yeah. that's not how, that's not the relationship yeah. <laughs> you want to have with that scale. So I think like, I am getting off track. Um, but I definitely think when athletes, the ones who are trying to be so short term, lose weight fast, mm -hmm. and get to a weight that's not sustainable, that's mm -hmm. not like people should enjoy food, <laughs> I think. <laughs> like and training too. Yeah. And and so I just feel like if you're feeling not happy then maybe it's time to reflect on what you're eating and how how to eat differently to be strong have mm -hmm. energy be able to perform because if you're too restrictive and lose too much weight then it might have a short-term bump of being really good but i haven't seen I haven't tended to see it be long term a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely long term there there is definitely the kind of that short term performance boost that's associated with weight loss, but unfortunately there's also long term consequences with not only physical health but also mental health as well. Yeah. And it's also a really tough um place to get out of once you're in that. And unfortunately a lot of athletes um lose passion for the sport. And when their initial intent was to become a better athlete, they, they eventually feel like they can't have, they don't have the energy anymore to be in the sport. And eventually that restrictive eating takes over. So it is definitely a very scary situation for athletes um, to be in because it also is very hard to get out of. So we want to set up our boundaries, which you said, and set up your boundaries as to what serves you well. And it can yeah. go back to social media or the scale or how you go about improving your eating habits and fueling methods as well and making sure that it works for you and it gives you good energy and doesn't kind of run or ruin your day. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And like, I'd like to say that like my nutritionist never has had me like weigh myself every day. He, for him, he's like, if you are performing well, that's, that's, that's the weight we're at. Like there's no race weight and I don't weigh myself I don't weigh myself going into races because I know I'm not able, well, usually I don't have a scale anyways, but I know I'm not able to take my brain out of it as much as I can during my daily training environment. And so like, I'm not, not connected or attached to it in a way that I need to be a certain weight. 
I guess. Yeah. yeah. So the weight to you is just, it's just another metric that you monitor throughout the year. And then you can look back and you can see if there's any trends and you don't see it as a negative that, you know, you are too much. You may even be using it that maybe you got too light and that you found that there was a, a decrease in performance. Um, or also that you just acknowledge that at certain times in the month with hormones that your weight fluctuates as well and you you accept that and you respect your body and you're gentle to yourself during that time but a lot of athletes can't have yeah. that relationship and so we have to make sure that we utilize those tools differently i'd love to know in your experience with being a professional athlete and elite athlete have you ever had any coaches or anybody tell you that you needed to lose weight or that you would be faster if you lost weight? No, I mean, I think maybe it's come like the one, the coaches from college, I think had talked to one of my teammates to thinking that was like a good way to approach me on the topic. I remember we were like in a park and I, supposed to have lunch together and it was like, talking about my pretzels I was eating and I was like why is she commenting on my pretzels and and then like I, love pretzels. I know and I didn't actually understand at the time like I was too we went right over my head but I so I think I kind of have like it was not very direct to the point where I didn't even pick up on it <laughs> until a little later um and I I guess like yeah I've I've worked with Sean for s since triathlon, since I started triathlon. And there was a little bit of time where I wasn't working with him anymore. And um, not because like we disconnected, but just because I was like, oh, like I didn't feel like it was a crucial thing. But then after Rio, I came back and use him every year since then because mm -hmm. I realized how valuable it is to have someone who's mm -hmm. guiding me. And mm -hmm. like, I think I've learned a lot, but I still like having someone support yeah. and can use it as much or like we talked about as much or as little, but like, I feel very fortunate because I know t tons of teammates and friends who haven't had this experience mm -hmm. as I have and who have been very negatively affected by coaches, even nutritionists um, in mm -hmm. sport. And I can look at the people who I've had on my on my team and they've been they've always looked out for me in in the wholesome sense mm -hmm. of what I'm trying to achieve as an athlete and in performance, but also ha like as a human being mm -hmm. and and not to make sacrifices that might look good as on the scale but yeah. aren't going to look good on the race course and aren't going to look good mentally or <laughs> emotionally <laughs> yeah yeah that's very true and so what advice would you have for athletes as well as for coaches because there's a lot of coaches out there um and a lot of nutrition experts out there as well um you know when you're at a race it can be so easy to assess yourself, compare yourself to other people, um, and to feel like your body isn't where it needs to be to perform at its best without even giving it a shot. And a lot of that is just that mental dialogue that sometimes can um, harm us before we ever get a chance to, to prove to ourselves that we're capable of something else. So this idea of race weight and having to achieve a specific number by a specific day in order to guarantee that you'll go this pace or have this result, how do you challenge those thoughts? What advice do you have for other people? Well, A, I would recommend don't get on the scale during <laughs> during race week um, if you're using it. Otherwise, like really detach yourself from it. I think learning to see uh, play, learning and playing around with because it might take some experimenting, but you're fueling during races and figuring out how to fuel properly and mm -hmm. do that by talking to a professional. But 
one of the things that I've learned over the years is that like when I was younger, I used to think, oh, if they have a like nutritionist as their title, or if they have coach as their title, then those people are always right because they're the experts. But if somebody's telling you to heavily restrict what you're eating, and it's not about your like stomach or what your stomach can handle, um, then I would maybe, well, I would for sure go and look for somebody else. And it's okay <laughs> to try out different people. Like when I, with my nutritionist, I was lucky because I was introduced to him right away. But my sports psychologist, one of the first sports psychologists I used, it wasn't a good fit. And so the next time when I was looking for a sports psychologist, I emailed and I wrote down exactly what I was looking for. Like basically like saying like, here are my strengths, here are my weaknesses. Like mm -hmm. this is what I want in a, in the person who's helping me. But I think it's important to not just go with somebody who has the title, but rather make sure that they are a good fit for you. And if they, if you try them out and they're telling you not to eat basically, or not to eat enough, then maybe try someone, someone else. And so that would be another one. But I guess the biggest advice I have for someone going into a race is never forget your strengths. Like, I use this a lot in it's pertains to nutrition and like body weight for races, but also, so like when I was in Rio, there was the course and there was a really steep hill and everybody talked about the steep hill and they didn't talk about the downhill. Yeah. And when I saw the downhill, I cried and that's all I could think about was that downhill, that downhill. And it, probably ruined my race <laughs> like almost certainly because my mind was so wrapped up in what I wasn't capable of doing what I didn't have the skills to do that I forgot everything else that I'm able mm -hmm. to do and mm -hmm. go like four years later when it was the La Lausanne grand final I had crashed like two and a half weeks before on the bike and I get to this pretty technical bike course and rather than think like oh what like oh shoot, like I'm not skilled enough for this course. I looked at it as, okay, well, I might be a little scared on the turns or I might be a little bit more conservative on the cornering, but I am strong enough on the straights. I am strong enough on the uphills mm -hmm. to be able to stay in this race and not just stay in it, but be highly competitive. Yeah. And I think you should do that with your feelings, no matter whether it's, anxiety or worrying about your weight like recognize like yes you have these thoughts that's okay but as soon as you recognize them throw them into whatever you feel like is going to move you forward whatever your strengths are and one of the exercises i've done before before a race is write down things about you when you are at your best self mm -hmm. and things that you say to yourself then and then write out why you're allowed to say them to yourself. And so it takes you from your fear-based brain or non-confident brain to a, a brain that's powerful and that's going to get you through the race course. Because like we've talked about, it's more the mentality mm -hmm. than, it, than it is your, your body that's keeping you from doing something. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. I love that advice. And really, what good is it serving you to bash your body, especially right before a race, right? Yeah. I mean, that's not going to do you any good. It's just going to sabotage your performance and all the things that you need to be hyper focused on. And also same thing during a race, you can't change your body during a race, right? But you can focus on what are my strengths? What, what's within my control at this moment? So I think that that's great. And I love the the homework assignments too that that you gave. So I'd like to kind of finish off and just ask kind of, you know, what are, what's your relationship with food like these days? You, you talked about that you love to eat. We hear so much about different diet fads and good and bad foods. Do you adhere to a good and bad food list? Does your nutritionist recommend that you stay away from certain foods? How, how did you create the the relationship with food that you have today? 
I was, it's definitely changed over the years and I feel like I've learned a lot because for me, I, I really enjoy desserts. I like sweet foods. So rather than overeating sweet foods, but making sure that I'm still happy and satiated, like satiated, I've found little tricks that I make me enjoy the food just as much, but like maybe it's not, maybe it's not ice cream, maybe it's vanilla flavored yogurt and mm -hmm. having those as like little treats. And I still have like a cookie and <laughs> like my sister-in-law bakes amazing cookies. So it's not, it's not like I never eat in desserts and I eat them during season as well. Like, uh, but off season, I have a lot of flexibility with my diet and I eat things that I won't eat as often mm -hmm. during right. the season. Yeah. And but a huge thing that we talk about with my nutritionist is more timing of how I'm eating things. So like making sure that I'm fueling with more carbohydrates and protein in the morning before I get started mm -hmm. and really having that through lunch as well. I I basically have my three big meals, but I snack through snack throughout the day as well, mm -hmm. um, making sure that I'm eating basically after every training session. Mm -hmm. um, we do really minimal fasted things. And if I did, it would only be like a 30 minute run in the morning prior to eating. And then I'm eating double carbohydrates after. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you learned after work? that run to make up? Yeah. Is that Sorry. something that you learned doesn't work for you? The fasting? Mm hmm. Yeah. It just makes me more depleted most of the time when I if I do it for too long um sometimes I like it I honestly like it because if my stomach's not ready to eat I can go for mm -hmm. a 30 minute run and be fine and not be like depleted energy wise um but we wouldn't ever do like a workout mm -hmm. on an empty stomach and then um and then my dinner is more protein based so it's not it has like a huge salad and my salads are like if you take a mixing bowl like that is my salad <laughs> and not like a petite bowl it's like people would be like oh are you serving a family and be like no that's mine well <laughs> so it's an amped up salad <laughs> yeah i like that hyped up yeah and and i think it's really important for people who are watching and I'm, i don't want to put words into your mouth of how you eat but from a nutrient timing perspective from sports nutrition that because there's so much emphasis on fueling around your workouts those foods are going to be less fibrous less residue less fat um, doesn't mean that they're avoided, but there's more emphasis on easy to, to digest carbohydrates and um, quick digesting proteins. And so, but if you just ate that way all day, where are the vegetables? Where are the fruits? Where are those nutrient dense foods? We've got to put yeah. them somewhere so we can then kind of shuttle them to the dinner time when there's not, when there's more time for digestion, more blood flow to the gut. So it's a lot easier to digest them. And like you said, because you're not getting them earlier in the day, we got to amp them up a little bit more. So it's not that you're avoiding carbohydrates in the evening, but it's just the timing of nutrition and kind of figuring out, it, here's all the calories that I need, where's the best place to distribute them? Yeah, and I think like when people eat with us, me and Tommy, they're like more like, why well, are you feeding like a small family? And like, like we can shop at Costco for the two of us. And I'm, very fearful of what our shopping is going to look like when we have children because it's just going to be ridiculous. But like, I think another part is, so there's different, as we were just talking about in a day, there's different ways to eat. It's also different ways to eat going into racing. So mm -hmm. like where one of the things that my nutritionist and I have found that works is like most often we're eating like more like dark brown type breads and grains during the week and during training. But when it comes to racing, I'm eating more white food and mm -hmm. like white rice, white bread, because it's easy to digest. And I'll start doing that a few days out from, from the race. I've also like 
dialed in what makes me feel good before a race, what doesn't. So we actually do, which is super random. We'll do curry almost <laughs> like a, like no spicy curry. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes me feel really good going into a race. It fuels me. It's like, I've found that it really works. I use the, we'll go to a race and we do like Uber eats or delivery apps a lot of the time. And so we'll find a place for like Thai food the first night. We'll eat the same thing every single night leading into the race because as soon as I find one that I trust and that hasn't made me sick or which I've never, again, knock on wood, I've never yeah. had a problem with it, but I just like really want to make sure that I've, I have confidence in what I've tried and <laughs> yeah. um, what's worked. So we'll do that every time leading into the race. And I've found that that makes me feel good, but every person is different. And the way you can make sure that you're fueled properly for your race and that everything is going to go according to plan is by practicing it in training to mm -hmm. from the lead up to what you're actually having out on the race course. Because I used to not eat anything on the race course because I'm like, oh, it's going to bother my stomach. But mm -hmm. your stomach can be trained and that fuel can give you that extra bit that you need during the race so that you can both mentally and physically be with it, be able to respond to other people, be able to find that gear, be able to sustain the level of intensity that you want to do for longer. So um, it's definitely something that I think it takes work. It takes more work than mm -hmm. and more awareness mm -hmm. than we might think because I feel like the fast track while that is like, okay, I'm going to get down to this rate, this weight and be, this it's like okay well how are you going to sustain that and mm -hmm. is that actually healthy for you mm -hmm. might not be a yes answer yeah no i think that's really great and also i think that if you're if your track is to lose weight, then you're losing sight of those things that can really fundamentally help you perform well, right? And so what I heard was that you're, you don't do a lot of fasted workouts, so you have energy, you're really focusing on recovering through your, after your workouts, you're dialing in your nutrition during your training. So it reflects what you'll do on race day, you figured out what works best for you. So it's like all these things involving eating, and, and then I always say that unintentionally the body changes because your body is preparing for the race. And when you fuel it well and you eat well and you train consistently, the body changes to that body that's going to help you perform to your best abilities. And it's also healthy as well. It's not injured. It's hormonally and metabolically and in good health and mentally in good health as well. So I really appreciate your honest feedback of everything that you said. And I think a lot of athletes, um, unfortunately on our side of the long distance triathlon, um, there's definitely a lot of restrictive eating. And so it's very um, reassuring to hear from somebody that races for two hours in the Olympic distance that you still value taking in nutrition and eating a high carbohydrate diet. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So my last question for you as we finish up here is what advice do you have overall for athletes just to help our athletic population, especially endurance and multi-sport athletes, how can we help athletes develop a better relationship with food and the body? I feel like there's, there's just so much chatter on being less, eating less, weighing less, um, and food is just not given the value that it deserves and a lot of body dissatisfaction. What advice do you have? Uh, I mean, we're going into an Olympic year for you and you're going to be training your butt off to be the best athlete that you can be. You know, what are some of the tools that you use that you can give other people to really help athletes, especially younger athletes, make sure that they're taking good care of their body through food and just good um, body awareness? Yeah, I guess it kind of goes back to the first question. I would say not to compare yourself to others would be a huge one because I feel like that comparison track is a lot of 
a lot of the times where people are getting these ideas of mm -hmm. what they should look like and you shouldn't look like anyone but yourself <laughs> like um, and i think also being able to be reflective and um not beat yourself up about if you are eating in a certain way and you make a mistake or i don't even want to say mistake if you have a treat like that's not bad like your body probably wanted that now you, should you have treats all the time probably not but then it just means like okay well get on track the next day you're not don't burden yourself with trying to then make up for this one little brownie or whatever you had it's it's good it's it's good to have a have a treat and be happy and eat it and enjoy it not feel guilty about it yeah. um i think also being reflective on what makes you feel good what makes you do well mm -hmm. um and finding those people who are in the right spheres to guide you if you need or want guidance or feel like you need that and mm -hmm. being meticulous, I want to say meticulous, but being very intentional about who you are working with mm -hmm. and why. And if that, if that person, like I said before, isn't the right fit or is telling you things that because in my, and I, I'm not a professional nutritionist or anything like that, but if you're medically able to eat a variety of foods and it's not making you sick, like I don't adhere to any specific diet. Like I, I eat dairy, I eat gluten, I eat, well, I don't know what the other ones are, but I eat everything. Mm -hmm. And it's more about how it's making you feel and look at food as fueling you and being good for you, not as something bad because it's not bad. Food is what's helping you do yeah. everything that you want to do and accomplish and um, recognizing that and maybe changing your mindset because I think so much it goes just in the mindset of how you perceive yourself and how you perceive mm -hmm. your actions and what you're doing and really change that to be like, well, this is me and I am strong. This is me and I'm powerful and not, this is me and I want to be skinny or I like, because mm -hmm. there's a lot your body can do no matter what shape it is at the, at this moment. And really recognizing that that's the case. You can do amazing things. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the, the most important thing that I see in you is just the, the developmental process and just thinking long term and yeah. the Olympic athletes, they have to think long term, they think in four or now five, five year cycles. <laughs> and so, you know, I think everybody needs to think in that way. When it comes to performance and body composition, you know, if you're trying to achieve a certain body composition right now in the end of January, you know, what's going to happen in June and July? Um, you know, you need to be strong to be able to stay with that training for the rest of the, the next few months until races really start to pop up again. So you have to take good care of yourself. And I think the other thing too, is that, you know, and I think a lot of it has to do with diet culture that, that, that we become convinced that we need to change the way that we look, that we are responsible or in control of how we look. And that puts a lot of pressure on people that you're supposed to look a certain way or that you are allowed to change the way that you look. And it's almost like that's morally responsible thing to do is to look a certain way. And so I think sometimes we need to kind of tune out some of those voices and be okay with looking a certain way, um, knowing that you're not wrong. There's nothing wrong with you for looking that way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think always, like I like to think of it as, when I go into races, I have certain nerves, I have certain anxieties or minor feelings when I'm not confident. But what I feel like is a strength is I have an underlying confidence that is always there, consistently there and like shining through any of my insecurities that's telling me I'm enough, I'm good enough, and I'm going to be able to be capable of achieving whatever I want to achieve. And I think that's 
something that if people find that, it makes them very powerful because you don't have to look to others to determine your self-worth. Mm. You already have it. And I, I just think it's really calming once you do that. Yeah. <laughs> like it's really a nice feeling. <laughs> so yeah. um, I really yeah. recommend. And I, I think also like it's a process to get to that point too. Like yeah. um, mentally and physically, like that takes work as well. And working on that aspect of yourself and being gentle and knowing like, mm. Oh, like we had talked about, like there might be some days that you don't feel at your best or, but see that as the odd part, mm -hmm. not, not as your normal of like, oh, this is how I always feel like, yeah. oh, today was, or this hour or this minute was not so good, mm -hmm. <laughs> but there will be better ones coming up. Yeah. That's right. Whenever you have a low, it just means a breakthrough is coming. Yeah, exactly. And like we talked about, longevity is such a crucial aspect of it. And everything you're working towards, even if you go to a race and you underperform, all of the work you put in to get to that race is still behind you. And it's just going to show up. And I always like to use the mantra, like, it's not my time, dot, 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 yet. <laughs> and the yet being the biggest part. And I love just that. Keeping in mind all like everything's going to present itself at the right moment. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes a lot of confidence to believe in that. And that's something athletes need to work on. Well, I can't thank you enough for so much of your um, tips and stories and um, your time today. Um, how can athletes follow you on social media? And then what, what races will we see you at this year? Yeah, so you can follow me on Instagram at kzafir is six. My name is challenging, but um, <laughs> it's Z A F E R E S, and then the number six. Um, and then also I do Facebook, so I have a Facebook triathlete page that's just Katie Zafir's triathlete. Um, and then my first race of the season is hopefully uh, WTS Chengdu in China in early May. Okay. Great. Well, we will be following and I always enjoy watching you. Oh, so thank you. thank you so much. We'll hang on here. And anything else that you'd like to mention before we get off? Nope. Just for everybody to remember how awesome they are. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Katie. <laughs> Good night.